All right, in chapter seven, we are going to be continuing our look at the victimization at chill of children, which we looked at with chapter six. Um, but in this chapter, we're going to be focusing on child abduction and child exploitation. As we learned in chapter six, when we looked at child abuse and neglect, um, most of that type of victimization is at the hands of parents, guardians, or other family members. And that type of victimization is far more common um, here in the United States than child uh, abduction or exploitation. However, that does not mean that child abduction and exploitation is not um, incredibly serious and that, that there aren't a lot of victims um, of both of these each year. Um, in 2002, the World Health Organization did a study on violence against children uh, internationally, so worldwide. And they focused on abduction and exploitation of children. This study estimated that uh, 150 million girls and 73 million boys under the age of 18 had experienced forced sexual intercourse or some other type of sexual violence or sexual exploitation. Um, a large number of uh, children in that particular study were found to be forced to work in the sex trade. UNICEF. Uh, did a study uh, in 2010 that was looking at child exploitation here in the United States, because we don't want to think that we are exempt from that here in the United States, that exploitation of children doesn't happen here. Um, it, so this study in 2010 found that at least 100,000 children are involved in commercial sex exploitation here in the United States. A similar study by the Department of Labor uh, that was also that was done in 1999 also found that about 100,000 children um, were working as prostitutes here in the United States. An estimated 14,000 to 17,000 foreign nationals are trafficked into the United States each year, and a number of U.S. citizens are trafficked within the United States, um, estimating that about 200,000 American children are at risk for, tra for uh, sex trafficking uh, into the sex industry. UNICEF estimates that 1.2 million children are trafficked worldwide um, for sexual exploitation. So the scope of the problem, as you can tell from those numbers, is very high, and we are not exempt here in the United States from exploitation. Um, based on that study that was done in 2002, the World Health Organization um, created seven strategies that they help could reduce violence against children. And these are very lofty goals as you read through these. Um, you'll see that this could be you know, very difficult to read all of these families, to identify families, first of all, that who are risk at risk for exploiting their children um, and uh, you know, ensuring that the families get the, um, the resources that they need and the children get the uh, resources and protection that they need. So their seven strategies were implant, implementing and enforcing laws limiting young people's access to firearms and other other weapons and then also criminalizing parents for violently punishing their children that's a little difficult here in the united states because corporal punishment is legal here in the united states it is uh, illegal in most eu nations changing beliefs and behaviors around gender roles ensuring safe environments by improving home environments providing parent and caregiver support, increasing incomes, providing support and treatment programs for juvenile offenders, providing education and life skills to improve children's life and social skills. So again, very lofty goals, but we can you know, kind of understand the difficulty in financing these kind of programs, identifying the families who are at risk and ensuring that they get the resources that they need. All right, when it comes to child abductions, NICEMART is a, uh, a national incident study of missing abduction, runaway, and throw to, throwaway children that does studies on um, kids who have been abducted, kids who have run away, kids who are thrown away. By the way, running away, we all know what that means. That means leaving home. When, when they do studies on runaways, the vast majority of children that run away from home are running away from abusive situations. Thrown away children means uh, a child has been um, kicked out of the house for various reasons. 
Um, so NYSMART does a lot of different studies under the, uh, the Department of Justice. Here's one example of a study that was done by NYSMART. Um, and you can see that it is 12 pages long, has lots of great information, um, but this, uh, this is just an example of some of the statistics on, um, on abductions and missing children. So non-family abductions, 33,000. Um, and by the way, when we're talking about child abductions, uh, the vast majority of child abductions here in the United States are by family members. Typically, they are non-custodial family uh, parents. But when we talk about non-family, uh, which we'll talk about why those are so dangerous in a minute, um, 33,000. Family abductions, 117,000. Runaway and thrown away children, 628,000. Um, so those are just some of the uh, examples of some of the statistics that the NYSMART studies have had. The NYSMART 2, this was um, one of the studies that were done, estimated that in 1999, 1 1.6 million children in the United States had uh, had experienced at least one episode of either running away or being kicked out of the house. Um, we don't know the number of them that were allowed back in, but they had experienced that at least once. Of these, only 21 of those situations, 21 percent of those were actually reported to the police. And the uh, youths uh, that who ran away and who th were uh, kicked out in this study um, were the vast majority were between the ages of 15 and 17. Um, that's a key kind of uh, age demographic. The FBI reports that the average age for a child to be targeted for prostitution here in the United States is between 12 and 14 for girls and 11 and 13 for boys. Um, and this includes kids that have run away or been kicked out of the house who turn to prostitution um, as a form to take care of themselves. Often, according to the FBI and other studies, they rely on pimps for everything, um, including you know food, shelter, protection. Um, often, not only are they sexually violated, but they are often beaten by their pimps. Um, it's just in no way a good experience for these kids who are left um, out on the streets. Now, the NYSMART 3 study um, compared the characteristics of stereotypical kidnappings of children in 2011 with findings that were done in 1997. Now, when we talk about stereotypical kidnappings, these are abductions in which a slight acquaintance or stranger moves a child at least 20 feet or holds the child for at least an hour. Um, <clears throat> the vast majority, and by the way, they're called stereotypical because they tend to follow a, um, a very similar pattern where a child is abducted from their home, usually their bedroom, um, and, you know, within the first um, the first couple of days, they are sexually assaulted, and then they are often um, murdered. So that's, and, and the vast majority of stereotypical are by, uh, and even though these are statistically rare, the vast majority of stereotypical kidnappings are by just a, an acquaintance, but usually by strangers. When you think about um, like poly class, uh, that would be an example of a stereotypical kidnapping. So when the NYSMART did a study, the study and compared the two years, they identified the following. Um, the use of force or threats were involved in most kidnappings. About 60% or three in five victims were sexually assaulted, abused, or exploited. The average age of the child victims were 12 to 17 for girls, white and non, not living with biological or adoptive parents, 50% of the 2011 stereotypical kidnappings were classified as sexually motivated crimes. The perpetrators of these stereotypical kidnappings were usually males between the ages of 18 and 35, were white or African American. Um, there was equal proportion in terms of the offenders. About 70% were unemployed and about 50% had substance abuse problems. Uh, fewer stereotypical kidnappings ended in homicide in 2011 than they did in 1997. Uh, in 2011, 8% of those cases ended in a homicide, where 40% ended in a homicide in 1997. The kidnappers lured almost 70% of their victims through tricking the child or non-threatening pretext rather than being violent. Almost all of the kidnappings, 19%, involved child victims. 
in 2011 resulting uh, recovering the child alive compared to only 50% of the victims in 1997. So they found uh, 92% of the victims alive in 2011, which is good news. Um, and again, we had more of those kidnappings ending in death in 1997, so only 57% of the victims were recovered alive. Estimates of detaining child victims overnight were three times the 1997 estimates, so 80% of those children were detained overnight. Um, cell phone and internet assistance assisted law enforcement to solve crimes involving two-thirds of the child victims. So that's good news, the implementation of um, you know, cell phone technology uh, has helped in solving a lot of these crimes. As I mentioned, when it comes to stereotypical uh, abductions of children that are done by strangers or just slight acquaintances, they are statistically very rare. So child abduction and murder that is not associated with child abuse and neglect is relatively rare, but it it is very high profile when these cases occur. They're every parent's nightmare. Um, the idea that a child can be removed from the safety of their home by a stranger um, in the middle of the night, typically, and um, sexually abused and sometimes um, murdered is horrifying. So these are just some examples of very famous cases. Uh, the Lindbergh is a very old case. Adam Walsh, you're probably familiar with his father. Jacob Wetterling, Megan Kanga, um, I mentioned Polly Class. I mean, th there are a number of these that, you know, unfortunately happen and they become very high profile and they really kind of um, scare us into thinking that this is something that happens a lot. But statistically, it is rare. Um, and statistically speaking, you know, that when this does happen, um, <clears throat> Children are typically um, sexually assaulted, and a number of them um, are murdered, unfortunately. All right, when it comes to the legal framework, um, when it comes to child abduction and child trafficking, child prostitution, there have been a number of um, legal issues that have been brought up. Here is um, the United Nation uh, convened um, against transnational organized crime in 2003, and that did address child trafficking and child prostitution, uh, recognized uh, nationally, the, I'm sorry, internationally, the vulnerability of child victims and m sought to adapt procedures to meet the needs, inform child victims of their rights, provide support for child victims, protect the privacy and identity of child victims, ensure child victims and their families are free from intimidation and retaliation, and avoid unnecessary court delays or delays in granting of compensation for children. This is important because um, the United Nation, uh, when they convene and come up with these types of recommendations, um, it not only, um, you know, these recommendations are not only for the United States, but these are for other nations internationally as well. So that's really important to see that uh, these types of recommendations have been um, set forth uh, internationally for victims of child trafficking and child prostitution. All right, some of the other legal framework related to trafficking um, of women and children. The first act that was passed here in the United States was actually back in 1910. So the Mann Act, which was also called the White Slave Act, was passed into law in 1910, making interstate transportation of women for the purposes of prostitution, debauchery, or immoral, purpose, immoral purposes a felony defense. Um, now, this law had a lot of problems, um, again, you know, being passed in 1910, it only, you know, applied to American-born women or American-born children. So a lot of changes have been made over the years to the Mann Act. Um, and it now addresses the act as being general neutral, so it's not just women or female children. Uh, it increases the focus on juveniles, uh, addresses issues of child pornography, international trafficking as well. So... Um, that was kind of the first act. It's been changed over the years. We also have, from 2000, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Um, this was um, enacted to pro prosecute traffickers as a better way to protect victims in the United States. 
This act reauthorized was reauthorized in 2003, 2005, and 2008, each time um, enhancing and strengthening the law. Um, so this is to help ensure that um, traffickers are prosecuted to the maximum potential. In 2015, we had the Justice for Victims Trafficking Act passed. This is a federal law that deals with human trafficking as well as several additional um, features. This particular law addresses and expands the federal response to trafficking into four important areas. Number one, victims and uh, benefits for service, um, sorry, services and benefits for victims, uh, the criminal justice response, sex, sex trafficking of children within the United States, and interagency coordination and training between the various agencies here in the United States to make sure that everybody is working together to ensure that um, sex trafficking um, is investigated, prosecuted, and that victims are given all of the uh, resources that they need. Infant abduction is the taking of a fetus or the infant under the age of six months by a non-family member. Um, statistically, it's actually very rare. Um, a total of 317 infants were abducted from 1965 to uh, between 1965 and 2017. Of those, 15 are still missing, 72 um, uh, 72, and that's 22 percent of the cases involved violence. The mother died in 36 percent of those cases, and in nine of the cases, um, the infant died. Now, fetal abduction, this is statistically very rare, and the first case of fetal abduction was reported um, in 1987. In this particular case, um, a woman named Darcy Kearts, who was 19 and married, approached a pregnant woman as she left a, um, a clinic in an, uh, near an Air Force base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Using a fake gun, she forced the woman um, initially to her house, but ended up out in a field where she strangled the woman until she went unconscious and then used car keys to remove the fetus from the pregnant mother. Of course, the mother passed away um, but uh, Pierce was eventually found guilty but mentally ill and received a 30-year prison sentence. So this is pretty rare, but it is um, a new a cesarious, cesarean section murder is a new category of personal cause homicide. Um, the vast majority um, of people who abduct infants are women between the ages of 12 and 50. And... They often are overweight. They've often told people that they are pregnant, um, even though they're not. Um, they indicate to the victim that they've lost a baby or can't have a baby um, to try to befriend them. They live in uh, they are they live in the community where the abduction occurs. They usually. Um, are keeping an eye on maternity units or nurseries or doctor's offices to keep an eye out for a pregnant woman um, or a hospital where infants are born, checking the security to see if they can remove the baby without anybody knowing. They're often married or living with a man who uh, assumes that they are actually pregnant. And then when they show up with the baby, um, they say that the baby is theirs. They often impersonate a nurse or other personnel when they remove an infant from the hospital. All right, when it comes to missing children, um, and these are children where we don't know where they are, um, their parents don't know where they are, their guardians or legal custodians don't know where they are. It includes two categories, those who are taken in either a uh, uh, by either a family member or in those non-family stereotypical abductions that we talk about, talked about, or those who are uh, have run away, who are thrown away, kicked out by a parent or guardian, but they don't know where. The, but the parent or guardian don't know don't know where they are, or are just somehow missing. So it just means that uh, people don't know where they are. People that are supposed to know don't know where they are. 
Profile of parental abductions. Remember I told you that the vast majority of children who are abducted are abducted by a non-custodial parent. So either parent, um, it's usually one that doesn't have custody. Males and female children are equally likely to be abducted. Mothers are more likely to abduct after a court order where the father gets custody. Fathers are more likely to abduct before a court order. So before that, because a lot of fathers feel that uh, courts are always, uh, are often, um, more favorable towards the mother, so they're less likely to get custody. So fathers are more likely to abduct a child before there's actually a court order. Um, fathers who abduct are more likely to be employed. Mothers who abduct are more likely to be unemployed. Most children taken are between the ages of three and seven years of age. Most are not hurt, by the way. Um, and uh, communication usually occurs between the abducted parent and the searching parent at some point, not always. Um, there are cases where children are actually taken out of the country, which makes it very difficult, um, if not impossible, for the non-custodial parent to get those children back. Um, accomplices, usually other family members or friends, are used in half of the cases. Um, and in most cases, um, the issues are resolved within a week, but there are cases where um, parents, non-custodial parents are searching for years for their children and where they know sometimes where they are overseas and they are unable to, um, to resolve it because uh, overseas authorities are not working with the authorities here in the United States. All right, categories of non-familial child abductors. So these would be those stereotypical killings that we talked about. The FBI has um, created four categories of non-family member uh, child abductors, um, and this was created in 2010. Pedophiles. Uh, this is the largest uh, single category of non-familial child abductors. These individuals are able to connect easily with the children and obtain their confidence, when, um, which makes the child vulnerable to abduction. Uh, pedophiles are typically very good at finding and singling out children who are vulnerable in some way. Um, the child often initially has confidence in the person and then becomes aware uh, at the um, and and then uh, usually when it's too late um, believes uh, comes to understand that the person is being exploitive towards them. Um, the second category is serial killers. These are methodical and ritual in their approaches using power, dominance, and control as tactics. Such abductions. Uh, are more likely to use a blitz attack method in which the offender suddenly approaches and overwhelms the child. Um, and this could include out in the open um, or by abducting them from their home. Profiteers, these, uh, these people abduct children for the purpose of criminal exploitation, for instance, uh, prostitution, pornography, or illegal adoption rings. And we kind of talked about child exploitation. Uh, childless uh, psychotics tend to abduct children in a delusional state, attempting to correct the reality that they're unable to have children. Um, those are related to what we just talked about with uh, infant abductions or fetal abductions. Um, the Nice Smart One study that, uh, that remember, Nice Smart, I told you, is uh, studies under the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, the Nice Smart One study indicated that more than 65% of children abducted by non family members are girls. Um, and of these, 46% are sexually abused and 31% are physically abused. 75% of the cases, the perpetrator is male. 67% of those males are under the age of 29, and most target children within their own ethnic group. Other types of missing children, I already told you what runaway children are and throwaway children. Um, keep in mind that when we talk about runaway and thrown away children, that the vast majority, um, especially of runaway children, um, are running away from something at home, some type of abuse. Abuse. Thrown away children often experience abuse at the home at the home as well, but they are thrown out um, by their parents for various reasons, are refused entry back into their home. Um, sometimes after running away, uh, basically they are uh, abandoned and deserted. 
So uh, the distinction between runaways and throwaways is not entirely clear because a lot of kids that run away initially and then try to come back home, they're not allowed to come back. So they actually, you know, would technically be both runaway and thrown away children. The NICEMART 2 study that was done in 2003 estimated that in 99 uh, 1999, again, there were 1.6 million children in the United States who um, had at least one of those episodes. So this is definitely something, and this tends to be older kids, by the way, runaway and throwaway children tend to be a little bit older. Amber Alert. Um, you're probably familiar with Amber Alerts. Uh, this is the... Um, America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response, and it was created in 1996 after the abduction of a nine-year-old in Texas named Amber Hagerman. Um, the purpose of the Amber Alert is to develop an early warning system between law enforcement agencies, broadcasters, transportation agencies, and the public to alert um, everybody, public and law enforcement, that a child has uh, been abducted. Each, uh, each state, all 50 states now, uh, have implemented the system. Uh, as of June 2017, 881 successful recoveries have been reported as a result of these alerts. So when a child goes missing um, and somebody contacts law enforcement, an Amber Alert is issued after certain criteria have been met. Um, the abduction has to be confirmed by law enforcement. The child has to be at risk of injury or death. Law enforcement needs to have information about the child and the child has to be less than 17 years of age. You've probably noticed that you get Amber Alerts on your phone. If you don't turn those alerts off, they will come through automatically on smartphones. You've also probably noticed that uh, there are Amber Alerts on um, uh, traffic signs that we have now. We have electronic traffic signs. And so you'll see Amber Alerts issued up there. And of course, they will also be on um, local news, uh, usually statewide. So if a, ch if a child is uh, abducted in, you know, let's say uh, South Georgia, the Amber Alert will go all through the state of Georgia and even regionally into neighboring um, states as well. But you'll definitely see it in the state that is uh, that the child is abducted in. Child labor. Um, forms of child labor include indentured, uh, indentured servitude, uh, child slavery, and these have existed throughout history. Uh, you know, we talked in a previous chapter how, um, you know, our, our view of children has really changed since the 1930s and 1940s, since we kind of recognized um, childhood as a separate uh, stage of development where children needed protection. Even today in the 21st century in parts of, uh, in other parts of the world, including places like Peru, uh, children are working um, and they're part of the economy. So children, you know, here in the United States, we have very strict labor laws that apply to children um, and children, you know, can only work at, after a certain age and only certain hours of the day. But, you know, before we had all these labor laws, um, children were viewed as, um, you know, able to work. They were cheaper to employ than adults, less likely to strike, better, better able to perform some of the work requirements that required little hands. Um, but again, with all of the changes that started happening on our view of children in the 1930s and 1940s, um, we did have we do now see childhood as a separate um, separate stage of development than adulthood, and we now have um, labor laws in place that protect children. The Fair Labor Standards Act was passed in 1938, which set standards, federal standards for child labor. Child trafficking. In uh, 2000, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish uh, child trafficking in uh, persons, especially women and children. Um, the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime addresses human trafficking issues through its global program against trafficking in persons. Um, I think we have kind of an, an idea, you know, here in the United States that child trafficking is not something that we need to worry about here in the United States. But um, as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, the statistics show that children are trafficked not only 
um, you know, worldwide, but here in the United States as well. And the fact that, uh, you know, a, an organization that addresses all nations like the United Nations has adopted some of these uh, statutes and protocols really drives home the importance of this issue. Um, it's usually a transnational criminal enterprise that recognizes neither boundaries nor borders. Um, they often take children from one nation and traffic them into another uh, nation. Uh, usually child traffickers are linked to other criminal activities, um, money laundering, uh, smuggling migrants, uh, document fraud. Children are recruited and trafficked to earn money by begging, selling goods, also um, child exploitation. Table 7.3 on page 264 of your textbook shows the various types of child trafficking, infant adoption. Um, this is generally when infants are um, uh, taken and then put up for adoption. Uh, UNICEF in 2010 estimated that 1,000 to 1,500 Guatemalan infants are trafficked each year. Now, some of these parents in some countries actually give up their children for financial gain, and some are abducted. Mail order brides as young as age, age 13, um, mainly from Asia and Eastern Europe, um, a lot of the former Soviet Union uh, countries, UNICEF in 2010 states these girls and women are powerless, isolated, and a great risk for violence. Domestic work and sexual exploitation, a large number of children are trafficked in West and Central Africa. Um, UNICEF estimated that 19% of domestic workers are girls. So these would be uh, young girls and young women who are um, used for um, domestic services that can include cleaning people's houses, um, taking care of people's children, child sex workers. Um, a survey indicated that 30 to 35 percent of all sex workers are between the ages of 12 and 17, and the global market of sex trafficking is over a $12 billion a year business with over, again, 1.2 million child victims child prostitution and child pornography. So this is using children, again, for sex work and for pornography. And a lot of this pornography, now that we have the internet, is put on the internet. And um, law enforcement has a real difficult time trying to track where these images are coming from. Uh, forced child labor and then child soldiers. And these are ch children in um, like the Congo and Rwanda who are forced to engage in um, in using guns and being soldiers for uh, for some of the violence that's going on in these countries. And there's not a lot of protection um, for these children with this type of trafficking. All right, when we talk about child prostitution, um, so we're talking about children that are, you know, either forced into prostitution um, by people that abduct them or who turn to prostitution as a way to... Um, to take care of themselves if they've been forced out of the house um, in some way. Um, some of the avenues to child prostitution, parents as role models, parental incest, chaotic, abusive, sexualized home environments. This is where we would find a lot of those runaway kids um, who end up living on the streets and engage in prostitution as a means to take care of themselves. Child sex rings, um, these would be uh, uh, typically with some type of child trafficking, trafficking and sibling incest. Now, there have been a lot of typologies created on both those who um, engage in sexual offenses against adults, typically females, um, and also in uh, those who engage in child sex offenses. Um, so first of all, in most cases, uh, Offenders gain sexual access to a child in one of two ways. Number one, by pressuring the child into sexual activity through enticement, encouragement, or instruction. And number two, by forcing the child into sexual activity through threat, intimidation, or physical duress. Now, there's something called grooming, and you probably heard of grooming when you've heard of some of these cases. Grooming involves um, targeting a child that uh, is somehow at risk. and 
it has a lot of different uh, stages, uh, but learning about the child's interests and vulnerabilities, gaining access to the child through sports, religion, um, food, alcohol, online computer, you know, enticing the kids with something that they're interested in. Um, molester seeks to fill some type of emotional and physical need. Um, and as they groom the child, like slowly groom the child into trust, um, then they start abusing the child. Uh, the, the, the grooming is also called the seduction process. Not like we see in adult seduction. We're talking about um, really just kind to identify kids that are vulnerable in some way befriending them, getting their trust, making that child feel loved and wanted, and then kind of, you know, coercing them into a sexual relationship. So we don't have, we do have coerced or forced. So with a coerced uh, a, a sexual molestation, the offender initially establishes a non-sexual relationship with the child. So there's a lot of grooming that takes place with coerced um, uh, sexual molestation. Um, the pedophiles in this case, in these cases, uh, are are usually very good at identifying kids who are um, at risk. There's a man named Groth. Uh, Groth and that's G-R-O-T-H. Groth has created a lot of typologies um, with sex offenders for both adults and children. Um, and he has this quote from a sex offender. I can look at a kids in schoolyard and tell you who is an easy mark. It'll be the child alone and off by himself. The one who appears lonely and has no friends. The quiet kid. The one no one's paying attention to. That's the one that will respond to some attention. So again, you know, finding kids who are at risk, befriending them, um, enticing them, making them feel wanted, making them feel loved, and then coercing them into a sexual relationship. Um, these type of offenders, um, they tend to uh, not have good adult relationships. So they tend to kind of seek out kids um, kind of as companions, really. Um, they feel safe with kids. They feel secure with kids. They They really can't um, they really don't have good adult relationships. Um, and once they gain that trust, um, then they start to kind of coerce the kids into sexual um, behavior. And uh, if that doesn't work, they also can result to some type of force. But there's usually not a lot of um, physical force used or injuries involved in coerced um, encounters, a course, uh, pedophile when they coerce um, children. Now, by contrast, in a forced situation, the offender gains access to the child through some type of intimidation, um, some type of threat, even physical threat. Um, they often use weapons. They often threaten the children. The situation is uh, very, you know, similar to what we would um, view as you know, rape against an adult. So there's usually violence, force, uh, in, 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 intimidation, and weapons use. We would also tend to see um, more injuries with forced use intimidation in terms of the pedophile um, uh, abusing the offender in these situations. Situational, impulsive versus preferential behavioral patterns. In the situational offense, there's evidence of impulsive opportunistic or predatory behavior, such as the victim being present or spur of the moment. Um, situation, situational child molesters do not have a true sexual preference for children, but they tend to engage in abusing children sexually for a variety of reasons, um, usually um, because the child is available, because they don't have um, appropriate uh, adult partners, because they are stressed, there's something going on in their life. Um, the uh, preferential behavior pattern, these are people that tend to prefer, again, children as companions. They tend to not have good adult relationships, um, and they choose children um, as, as really kind of an, a, 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 a person to hang out with. And then, um, also as a person that they want to use to gratify their sexual, um, their sexual, um, 
impulses, if you will. Um, so situational, more likely to be impulsive, more likely to be one or two times, where preferential is more like a behavior pattern where they tend to prefer kids sexually, they tend to be attracted to kids sexually. These are more the typical pedophile. High versus low contact. Um, this is looking at how much contact offenders typically have with uh, children. High contact means they tend to hang out with kids a lot or they work in a occupation where they are around children like a teacher. They volunteer um, in situations where they're more likely to be around children. So, um, you know, being like a scout leader or a sports um uh, you know, a sports coach, something like that. So they have a lot of contact with children in their life. Low contact, they don't have a lot of contact with children and um, are more likely to engage in situational impulsive behaviors towards children um, and seek out children because they don't have contact with them. All right, so this is, um, you know, another difficult chapter because anytime we're looking at the exploitation or abuse, especially when we're talking about sexual abuse of children, it's always difficult. Um, let me know if you have any questions on anything in this chapter. Otherwise, have a great rest of the day.